Okay, um, I want to go now to Daniel 9.24. I was planning on doing it the last session, but <clears throat> I had to finish up with some things uh, in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the uh, broadcast I did on Daniel 9.27. So now we're going to go to Daniel 9.24. Let me read this to you. Seventy weeks have been decreed, or 490 years, for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, if you're a futurist, your view is that these things haven't been accomplished yet. There's still sin in the world. The transgression continues. Uh, I, we don't know how to relate to uh, seal up vision and prophecy, and we don't know what it means fundamentally to anoint the most holy. All of these things are in the eyes of the futurists still future, that Jesus didn't totally finish all this thing, all these things. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus finished all of these things within the context of 490 years. If you think the 490 years are not finished yet and there's still seven years, then you would have the view that, well, yeah, I agree with you, Candace hasn't happened yet because the 490 years haven't transpired. So how, how are we to understand this? Uh, how, how, do we, how are we to get over this idea that this is all future? So a proper understanding of all the things that Jesus accomplished when he came is key into proving that the 490 years has has really been completed. First, the transgression, it says here, uh, 490 years have been decreed for, you, for, for your people and your holy city, for your people and your holy city, okay? So the enforcing of this covenant uh, is what this is all about. The transgression fundamentally was basically, I think uh, it's fair to say, two parts. Number one, the, the Hebrews were not keeping the Sabbath, Sabbatic rest of the land. Every seven years, they were required to let the ground go fallow. Don't plant nothing. The, 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 the earth has to rejuvenate, get the minerals and the vitamins and everything in the ground that's necessary for successful uh, crops. So let the land grow. Let the land grow fallow for seven years. They didn't do that. They 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 just couldn't believe that God would get them through that one year where they had no crops. So they di they disobeyed the 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 sabbatic rest of the land. So so God is saying here, okay, I'm going to penalize you now. All of those years. Uh, that you did not keep the land fallow. All those, all those Sabbath rest years. So, so there were seventy of them. Seventy Sabbath rests of the land they violated. So it says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you keep them consecutively now. So it's gonna be all of those Sabbath years times seven, four hundred ninety years. And, and because of that transgression, this is why this penalty is coming upon you. But it was also because. The, the Hebrews were bringing into their temple these compromised worship idols of, of the pagans, uh, of, of the ungodly. They were worshiping the moon god. And, uh, and God hates the, the, the uh, agreement with the moon god. The moon god is, uh, comes out of Saudi Arabia, and it, it was uh, known as uh, Al-Ella, or, or the god Toth from Egypt. And uh, so... Uh, he made a, quite a statement about the moon god uh, when he destroyed Jericho, which was called the moon god city. There were two, Ur of the Chaldees, and there was Jericho that was destroyed supernaturally by God when, when Joshua ran, walked around the place. And the walls fell down, supernatural. That's God's statement about how he felt about the moon god. Today, you know, up on the, up on the, on the uh, Temple Mount, they have the... Uh, the Dome of the Rock, which inside says God has no son. Uh, so, so you have this whole 
uh, uh, Al-Ella, which is now Allah, uh, in competition with Jehovah. And so people that think that God's going to allow for there to be a temple built up there when the, one of the shrines up there says God has no son, it's a joke. That would be a violation of the law of the house, which is in Ezekiel. So we we should not look for a temple to be built up there that God would ordain and be something that Jesus would walk through when he returns. They, we, we, he, the Lord, if they build it, he won't come. I tell, I tell you that right now. And I have no qualms about saying that. He's that the, the Lord is not Monty Hall. Let's make a deal. He no. He's not going to compromise his who he is be, to make peace on earth. Okay, he just does not work that way. He doesn't need to make a deal. He's the Lord God Almighty. So the idea that the Jews are going to build up there north of the Dome of the Rock, uh, or that the Christians are rooting for it, or the Messianic Jews are rooting for it, that that isn't going to be where the temple of God is if there is to even be a physical temple on the earth. Well, people say, well, you know, Ezekiel 40 to 44, that's the messianic temple. No, it's not. Uh, that's a whole other teaching I'll bring another time, but that's not that. that. That was a missed opportunity that God gave to the Jews when they were in Babylon, and it was never built, never will be built. Well, now, what about Revelation? It talks about the third temple. That's not the third temple. It's talking about something entirely different, another teaching for another time. So all of these things that we've come to see and believe and watch for, uh, we're watching in vanity. It's not the way to look at it. Jesus fulfilled this scripture here where it says, the decree for your people to finish upon your holy city, to finish the transgression. The transgression was finished after the the seven years of Daniel, 490 years, and the part of the transgression in its fulfillment was the destruction of the, of the second temple uh, in 70 AD. And that was brought upon the, the, the fulfillment of the transgression was total destruction of the city. Total destruction of the city. And all you have to do is read Josephus, who was an eyewitness of what happened there. And it, it, nothing like that ever happened on the earth, where, where a whole civilization and culture was uprooted and destroyed. And their whole belief system uh, was brought down. Nothing like that had ever happened. And the people carried off for 2,000 years. That is the tribulation. And to think of it in other ways is just unconscionable, but it's because we don't really know the magnitude of, the, of what happened in Jerusalem when the Romans came in, the prince that is to come, the principality that animated Titus, who went into the temple and destroyed the temple and committed the abomination of desolation there and the altar of God. So Jews tried to escape. Jesus said, when you see them, you know, the city encompassed round about with armies. You better get out of Dodge uh, because then will come a tribulation. So the tribulation, uh, and by the way, over 2 million people were thrown in the Kidron Valley, murdered. Some got away down into Petra and some fled up north you know, and some got all, all the way over to Spain. But when you see that take place, when you see them getting to the holy place, you better, there's no more turning back. It's the end. That, that's what happened to Jerusalem. That's what happened to, to Israel. Uh, the name was even changed uh, after a while through Hadrian to uh, 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 Palestine. That's where the whole idea of Palestine came from, was from Hadrian. And Alia Capitalia was what Jerusalem was called. So not only were they carried off, but the whole civilization was destroyed and their holy city's name was changed and uh the whole land's name uh, changed from israel to palestine so nothing like this had ever happened and never again will happen so we're living in the time of the tribulation now i mean when you th when you think of you know, oh, this is this is nothing compared to what it's going to be like i hear people say that I'm like really this is pretty pretty bad what's going on. I mean, this, this is a vexation of the soul every day, you know, with what we're having to deal with in, th in this outer court where we find ourselves. But we're the temple of God. And they, they may try to build a third temple. I think they probably will. I've interviewed 
people in Jerusalem, Rabbi Richmond, and they've built all the artifacts and the, the musical instruments. They're, tra they're training the Kohanim and this resurgence and the uh, attempt to rebuild the Jewish culture uh, and from what, as it was in the first century and days of old is, uh, is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. But it's nothing that we should really embrace as a sign. The sign is the ten virgins, five are wise and five are foolish. Will the Son of Man find faith? Are you spending time in the courts of the Lord? Are you getting into sympathetic resonance with the throne of God? Is that happening for you? Are you having visitations? Are you having visitations from God's kingdom? I am. I have them all the time. You, it should be common. Jesus said, you'll see angels ascending and descending on Ben Adam. Ben Adam is us. Ben Adam wasn't just Jesus, son of man. Everyone's Ben Adam. Ezekiel was called Ben Adam. Other people were called Ben Adam. We are the Ben Adam of God. We're, we are the Elohim of God. We're the Elohim. We're more than just mere men. And our heavenly family is our real family. And they'll, they want to visit with us. And if you're not having that, then you're not having angels ascending and descending upon you, which is a promise by Jesus to Nathaniel. And it's part of our inheritance. David even said, Lord, you visit me even while I'm in my bed at night. Hope that's happening for you. If it's not, then you need to seek it because that's the people that are putting on the oil. That's the people that are growing in the Holy Ghost. Remember, Holy Spirit to Holy Ghosting in us. This is what God's trying to perfect in us. And that's what it means to dwell on Mount Zion, city of the angels. So Jesus fulfilled this in what he said. It was fulfilled in time. Uh, it ended with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So 70 weeks have been, been decreed upon your city and your people to finish the transgression. That transgression has been finished. That 490 years allotment of seven, 70 myths, land Sabbaths has been fulfilled. The land's been, uh, I should say, the, the transgression has been completed. Then it goes on to say, to make an end of sin. What does this mean to make an end of sin? Well, the, the, the futurists would say, well, he hasn't done that because there's still sin in the world. Well, who can deny that? But that's not what this means. When Jesus made an end to sin, he made it through his covenant. His covenant was that he would destroy uh, the record of sin in our lives. He made an end of sin. So people that, let's, let's look at it this way. People that look at Donald Trump, I'm just going to use him as an example of, of uh, how people misconstrue uh, the end of sin. There's no doubt that every one of us has committed sin, including Donald Trump. OK, but when people look at him, they say, well, you look what he did. He did this to women back then. And he's a corrupt man and he was corrupt in his business dealings. And I blah, 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 blah. You know, they look they dig up his past and all the dirt. But when he accepted Christ in prayer with uh, Dobson, focus on the family guy, uh, God absolved him of, of, of his sins, his sins, past sins forgiven. There, he, he made an end to Donald's sins in that respect because the covenant of Jesus eradicates the record of sin, it eradicates it, it's gone. Uh, that doesn't give us license to sin, but the point of it is, is the new covenant blots out our former transgressions. Now, we don't want to continue in his sins and, well, that's pretty cool. I'm, I'll just do what I please. No, no, that, that's not the point. The point is, if since he's forgiven us, then should we continue to sin? We still do. But, but that isn't something we should be doing willfully. We stumble around and fumble and blah, 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 blah. And sin so easily besets us. But Jesus has forgiven us of sin. He's blotted out all of our transgressions. People that have uh, had past records of infidelity and so forth, 
uh, that think that just now I'm not going to do that anymore. I'll just be a good person. Your sins aren't blotted out yet until you come under the blood covenant and the, the eraser of sins, which is the blood of Christ. And not only that, uh, he did away with what condemns us of those transgressions, which is the law. Now, if you go back and study the book of Romans, it says from the time of Adam to Moses, uh, there was sin in the world, but he did not impute sin until the law came. So the people that lived from Adam to Moses really had a not get out of jail free card. Because when it says impute there, it means he doesn't hold it to their account. There's no accounting of that when there's no law. So until the law came, people, even though they died, uh, their sin wasn't imputed. Well, guess what? When there's no law, God does not impute sin. So we're in a situation very similar to the time of the people from uh, Adam to Moses. Because when Jesus died, he took away the law. There's, there's no law. Uh, there's therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The law is not applicable now as something that condemns us before the Lord because he took away the law so he does not impute sin. So in that respect, uh, uh, he made atonement and he brought in everlasting righteousness. So the everlasting righteousness is the new covenant. He brought that in. It's everlasting. I mean, you may sin, and uh, the way to deal with that is to go before the Father and to say, take responsibility, confess your sins, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. So when he talks about, let me wash your feet, Peter, uh, foot washing isn't to have be a service in front of a congregation where everybody lets their stinky feet be washed. It means that the, your walk will get defiled as we live in this world, but there's an everlasting righteousness that we can go to to cleanse us of those times in the day or the week where our walk gets dirty and musty. And we go to the fount. And that's why it says about the new covenant and the communion elements, do this often in remembrance of me because you do show forth the Lord's death. The Lord's death is the key to walking with God. That's why Paul said it, that I might know him, the fellowship of suffering, being conformed to his death, that, we, that, that there's a conforming to that death that is a recognition that we really, re, we, we really daily need to return to the everlasting righteousness of Christ in his blood. That's what that means. Jesus did that already. It's done. It's a done deal. To think its future doesn't understand the new covenant properly. All right? And then it says, to seal up vision and prophecy... Um, this is a little bit tougher to deal with because in what way is prophecy sealed up? Well, the, 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 set, the week's prophecy is sealed up. You know, I'll do this. But I think there's a lot more that you can look at here too, even though there's a lot of prophecies that haven't been sealed up, fulfilled, like the beast prophecies and things like that. But the prophecy of the 70 weeks is uh, fit, fulfilled when he did this. When he when he he died and prophesied that this would happen and the 70th week would occur, but also Isaiah said this about concerning the suffering servant, that's been sealed up. He would come and he'd be Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, that's been sealed up and done when he with his arrival and his death. It's all been sealed up. But to, for me, the most exciting one is, uh, and I talked about it before, and I don't think it's. It's a bad idea to, to go over it again. He will anoint the most holy. Uh, again, when he died and rose from the dead and uh, was seen by Mary and she was clinging to him, he said to her, uh, listen, I got there's more to do yet. I'm not quite finished. So I got to go to my father. He was talking about cleansing the heavenly tabernacle, which was defiled by the war in heaven or the war in the heavens because the heavens were defiled by the war and they had to be... Uh, they had to be cleansed. And he went into the heavens through his own blood and cleansed the sanctuary, the, the heavenly sanctuary. So that took place uh, right after he rose from the dead. And then, of course, he came back and appeared to his uh, followers 
So the, the heavenly uh, tabernacle had to be cleansed uh, so that we could have entry into it, so that we could go there by faith and, and see it and begin to understand that we, we get to go before the throne of God and have audio and audience with our Father. He hears our prayers and we can go before him humbly and entreat him for his favor and his the answer to prayer, as long as we aren't selfish about our prayers. Uh, then he hears our prayers. And that's quite a thing. And uh, so Jesus cleansed the heavenly tabernacle, and then it also permitted him to send the Holy Spirit to the earth, which uh, evangelicals, people are dispensationalists, they don't understand the magnitude, not only of his redemption, but of what he extended to the earth in terms of the power of the Holy Spirit that issued forth on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was uh, a holiday uh, in celebration, uh, but it also is a day that should be experienced by all God's people. You can have a personal Pentecost if you seek for it, God will give it to you. So that's all for today.